Can you tell me a bit about young Kelechi? Because you grew up, <laughs> you were born in Nigeria, right? Mm-hmm. And moved to London at a young age? Was like it? when I was five. Yeah. Mm. So what was life like as young Kelechi? Um, it wasn't nice. It was not nice. I mean, I can't even say being in Nigeria was particularly uh, great. But my mum came to London while I was in Nigeria because she wanted to come and study over here. So I was there and I was staying with her her brother, my uncle and his family. So from the little I think I can remember, it was all right mm. in the way that Nigeria is. I remember lots of tastes and sounds because I love eating. Mm. Um, but then when I came over here, I was coming to meet a whole different family dynamic because my mum had already um, got a new partner and she was pregnant with my brother, my immediate younger brother. So I was coming in to meet a whole new family unit. So for me, I it kind of reinforced that I was an outsider when I was living in Nigeria. Even at that young age, I felt like an outsider because my mum wasn't there. My mm. grandma was there, but I still very much felt like an outsider. And then I came to England and moved into this place with my mum in Peckham. And they already had a new family unit. So again, outsider, I went to school. I had an accent. So all of these, you know, children were like, oh, you speak funny. Mm. So again, outsider. So I started to kind of get used. I started to get used to the idea of being on the outside. So I never really like stressed about making friends so much. I just stressed about making an impact. I always wanted to just be good at stuff. Um, And I don't think though those things are separate. I think that when you are you find yourself on the outside, you want to make the most of being there and Mm. be like, well, people are going to notice me when I have all of these things. Um, So I always focused on working um, a lot and being like in the school plays, getting the leads in the school plays and being really great at like sports. So I did 200 meter sprint and football and that. So always focused on like excelling at those things. Um, Is that because maybe do you think they're the obvious things to, to be like, look, I'm really good at, Mm -hmm. Um, you can show someone or you can prove that you're really good at yep. football or 200 meters because you win the races and you exactly. get medals and acting you, you become the lead yep. whereas like academically it's less hard other than like obviously mm-hmm. exam results mm-hmm. and stuff but that's more like um over like mm-hmm. not look so. at me look at me but like I'm good at this thing mm-hmm. And yeah, even in the academic sense, like I would not settle for being in any class lower than the top set. So again, it was that idea like, no, I need to be top, top, top at everything. Like I need to be here. And I think I was doing the gifted and talented program. Mm. They used to have that when I was younger. So they'd select like a few girls or a few people from each school in the borough. And they get to like go to places and meet um, like lots of influential people as part of programs and stuff. Um, But yeah, then in the mix of all of that there was like the sexual abuse that I had when I was younger because I was staying with um a childminder because my mum had to work so she put me with the childminder and then I never spoke about it to her or anyone really until I was about 16 so I think what age was it about seven so it's a long time yeah from seven to from seven to like maybe nine Mm. but it really kind of distorted my sense of self but I'd it only distorted my sense I guess it distorted my sense of self And it meant that interpersonally in friendships and things, I didn't really want to be friends with people. Mm. So in all of my report cards, it'll be like, Colette, she's really, really good at her studies and she's great at this and great at that. But she's rather moody and she doesn't, Mm. she gets annoyed quite a lot and she doesn't want to talk to people and she's very irritable. So looking back on those things, obviously I understand why and I wouldn't expect them to. Um, But I think that what happened there really for me was more of an objectification of self. So because that happened, I was very focused on being the best, like being really, really good at things because my thinking was, well, if I'm great at everything, then nobody can touch me or hurt me Mm. again. But you're just working from a wounded space. And um, when I finally told my mum about it when I was like 16, it was just sad because really what I heard in what she said back was pretty much like, well, this is what happens to girls, you know? You just... Wow. What can we do in this society? This is just, mm. do you think that, that all of us here haven't had like uncles try to touch us inappropriately? And I was thinking, fam, that that's not something that we should have as mm. like a norm, like something needs to change. So I would think th- to myself that at that age of 16, even though it wasn't apparent to me yet, that's when my sense of like advocacy was more um, kind of, emboldened because I just thought someone needs to speak out yeah. and I'm not going to settle for a child in the future to be like oh well that's just the way it is because it doesn't have to be no, that way of course it's mm. like no one should be mm-hmm. you know should have yeah. to go through anything like that and it's yeah. 
just and again maybe you know i don't know from kind of a, a parent's point of view you know they grew up in completely different times i'm mm. not saying stuff is right you mm -hmm, know mm -hmm, at mm -hmm, all mm -hmm. but you can kind of understand in a way mm -hmm. how they might have that mindset of like well you know it's just a thing yeah it's like they kind of brush it aside and i think that's what made in a way their generation so great mm. is that they could really just brush stuff aside and mm. had that real kind of tough interior and exterior mm -hmm, whereas mm -hmm generation generationally us you mm. know we're open to a lot more mm -hmm. things through the internet and social media and etc yeah. so we're a lot more i guess w uh, uh, more empathetic to, yeah. to things and situations and yeah it's just it's, no i agree i think they had you know? they had to do what they needed to do to survive yeah it's a survival um, thing completely. but they they did all of that to survive and i think in order for us to live so i think that it would be a mm. disrespect for me um, to see that they've done all of those things to survive. And then I go into survival mode as well. Mm -hmm. And I'd only ever been in survival mode. So from the, from a, arriving in this country um, for very, very, like well into my twenties, I spent that just simply in survival mode. And when you're in survival mode, you're not living, um, you're disconnected mm -hmm. from self because you're not even tapping into that empathy. You're not tapping mm -hmm. into any of and that. Is that because of that background yeah. of sexual abuse? Yeah, yeah. Because you have to disassociate, like you have to disconnect from self. Otherwise, I think what you're doing is then feeling the very real pain of what happened and that loneliness and everything else. So, um, yeah, it was just a lonely time. It was lonely and it was miserable and it was just horrible. I don't and I didn't I wasn't my best self then. I was achieving things, but I wasn't my best self. So I think it was just like after uni, uh, when I finished university in like 2008, that I thought to myself, wow, it's just really... Um, not nice to exist inside my body, inside my head. It's not a nice space. Mm. And so I, that's when I started looking into therapy and things like that. So, because you only have your body and you only have this one body. Imagine just living in it for the entirety of your life and you're miserable. Mm. And I knew one day just sitting on the bus, I was just like, I don't want to do this. It just feels so unhappy in here. And so I started looking into therapy and I didn't start until like a couple of years later. Um, but when I finally did, like my growth was exponential, mm. but I needed to start somewhere. And I think in doing that, I could also see all the other people who were hurting. And I think that makes a big difference when you can suddenly see those who are hurting around you rather than just being focused on your hurt. Yeah, 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 I know what you mean, mm. exactly. And how do you feel then when you see that with other people? Do you want to like help them or advise them or are you like mm. you've kind of got your own stuff to deal with you have to discover it for yourself what's your what kind of role do you tend to take I think it differs on a case-to-case -case basis but I think ultimately I sh I try to not get involved or try to fix or help in um, in a major way because I know that that's actually just part of my coping mechanism I go out to go and fix other people mm. and things as a way to distract from actually just working and fixing myself or healing myself so when I see those situations I'll suggest things but ultimately I try to keep myself out of it because you can't be somebody else's healing. You can't, no matter how much you want to be, because ultimately you want to almost compensate and make up for all the hurt that you've suffered. But it's not, it's not how it works. Mm. It's not like people find their path in their time. And I'm always ready to like advise and be like, oh, you can go and see this person or you can try this thing. And I think that's why I took to um, tarot so much because you've got church telling you that you're inherently a sinner. And then you've got um, the effects of being sexually abused as a child where you inherently feel worthless and not of value and dirty and things like that. So all of these things throughout my life, and then you've got society telling you that as a woman, you either exist within the virgin or whore dichotomy, which is mm. false. So you've got all of these things pretty much telling you that you're less. And then you discover this thing in terms of tarot or spirituality that actually says, no, you're fine as you are. Mm. You're great as you are. You just need to remind yourself that you're great as yeah. you are. And that's the journey. That's the challenge. Yeah. And you said something great earlier, which I always try to get this message across is mm. like your past and whatever experiences you had mm. don't define you. No. They shape you and help you become who you are. Mm -hmm. And like without them, no matter how great or how horrible or, mm. you know, how mediocre, mm -hmm. like they have shaped you to who you are today. Yeah. And then from here on, it's your responsibility to kind of discover the best version of yourself. Yeah. And I feel like, yeah, you, you hit that massively on the head earlier. Yeah. Um, so f from the kind of um, 
from being such a young kid and then speaking to your mom mm. about the abuse at 16 did you say mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. why do you think it took you such a big period of time to kind of open up about that I think because um, I'd gotten used to not speaking, not to the extremes of Maya Angelou. Like Maya Angelou just stopped speaking after after mm. her sexual abuse. She just didn't talk for years, I think. Mm. Um, it wasn't like that. I was still speaking, but um, not the words that needed to come out. And I think that you can swallow your words and swallow your words and swallow your words for so long. Some people swallow their words for pretty much their entire mm. life. Now you've got a choice that like, you're either going to choke on it or you're going to have to cough it up. And so I, I'd always felt that at some point I needed to say something. And I remember when I was probably like 11 or 12, I remember walking into my mum's bedroom and getting ready to tell her. And I think she was asleep at the time. And then it kind of freaked her out that I was standing in the doorway. (laughs) And so she was like, what do you want? And I just went, oh, nothing. And then I left. So even at that point, I wanted to say something, but something as little as what do you want? Like made me change my mind. It gave me almost like an excuse Mm -hmm. to like not not do it. Um, but I think that doing it at 16 was just when I needed to do it. I think that's when I started to have more of a cognitive understanding that, okay, it's not my fault. Okay. I can speak about these things and, and go from there. Mm. Well, full credit to you because you know, you've become an amazing woman Thank you. from it. So it's, it's amazing that, you know, to have the courage and I can only imagine, mm. you know, the courage that it needs to kind of really speak out to particularly, you know, your mum, who's mm-hmm. someone who you know is cared for you raised you and it yeah. must be very very hard and you know I think even if it's not you know exactly the same situation but like mm. you know struggling with mental health or mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know anxiety or you're feeling stressed about exams or mm-hmm. whatever it may be it's it's so powerful to just pull some to pull, speak yeah pull yeah. someone aside and say I'm going through this mm. because I feel like a lot of the time we put in our own minds we put this burden of like oh if I tell someone it's gonna burden them now. yeah 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 and a lot of the time you find it doesn't someone will no. actually go oh do you know what i've been feeling similar way, yeah. or i've had this thing or and you you, you actually find a really deep connection between definitely you through having those conversations speaking helps speaking definitely definitely helps and i do think sometimes though that sometimes you tell people and you shouldn't be too um you shouldn't have such high expectations of what you think that they're going to do when you tell them like i thought that i would tell my mum and she would hug me and she'd be like oh i understand and it was very anticlimactic it was mm. just like nothing it was just like in fact i took on another burden by realizing that wow you didn't you you went through something similar and you probably mm. haven't even processed it yeah. it's just there um so there was something that i learned in that but what i think i gained most in that moment was the um the idea that I am responsible for my own healing I expected to tell her and somehow she would fix it yeah yeah um and things would go away but actually in that moment I was just reminded again by the universe that no you can tell people and it can be there for you but your responsibility to heal is still your own Mm. and that's just it Mm. so what's your your experience with the therapy off the back of that being like because I I can't remember how many years ago, maybe five, six years ago, maybe mm-hmm. more, um, went through a kind of, uh, I've having this conversation earlier about mm. whether to call it a breakdown or a breakthrough, but mm. either way, a breakdown. Mm. Um, and at the time, the girlfriend I was with who experienced it, uh, her mum was a therapist and recommended me to someone else. So mm. I went to four or five therapy sessions with mm-hmm. this lady who I just didn't, it just didn't, I just didn't get on with it mm. at all. Um, and but I've always said I think everyone should have therapy mm-hmm, because I think mm-hmm. it's very good to have an open place where you can talk about things and learn about yourself yeah. and etc cetera, etc cetera. Mm. but for me it just didn't whether it was the therapist or was, yeah. I just wasn't ready for it yet or there was there was some kind of friction in me that yeah. just again signaled that just said y- you can't be doing this right now mm. so I stopped um, but then I did all of the stuff you were talking about mm. learning how to heal myself and work mm. on myself and all of the kind of things that I always talk about on mm. this podcast and online and everything. Mm. Um, but for you, how's the kind of therapy Going. process been and how yeah. long have you been having it for? Are you still having it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I go every week. I go every week. It's expensive as fuck, but I go every week. <laughs> but worth um, it, right? Um, it's worth it. It's worth it. I'd probably spend that money on trainers, to be honest. So I might <laughs> as well spend it on therapy. Um, 
the first therapist that I had, I did not like her. My God, it was so tedious. I had mm. like eight sessions with her, I think, or tw- yeah, eight sessions through the NHS. She was a not, I did not like this woman. And there wasn't anything specifically that she did. We just didn't get along. And it's like you said, maybe I wasn't ready for it. And I thought that I was, but then I doubt that because I shared so much or I try to share so much with her. Cause it's like, finally you're in a space. Somebody's listening to just you. You can talk. I just got nothing back yeah, yeah. and I didn't like it. And I thought, oh, I'm not going back. And our sessions ended and I was thinking to myself, I'm glad I'm not going back that that was not what I thought it would be. But I still knew that it's possible to get something great out of therapy. And actually what helped me was the moment I had um, a black female therapist mm everything switched up and I'm always saying for me like black women saved my life because the moment I got my first uh, black therapist Sarah suddenly it's like I could share and when I was talking about certain things culturally she understood yeah I think that's massively yeah. important because not meaning to cut you off mm. but the, the the woman I had was like an older mm. uh, white woman mm. but I just felt like I'm telling her these things about growing up with like pressures of social media and mm-hmm, it, mm-hmm. I, I I just felt like she didn't get what no. she knew what I was talking yeah. about, but she didn't get it. Yeah. Like she, hasn't, she probably wasn't even on Facebook. Or, <laughs> do you know what I mean? It's like, yeah, and them it, ones. And that's, like, yeah. And it sounds really stupid, but you want that connection. You want someone who, if they're there to help you mm. and help you discover, you know, about yourself and heal yourself, they need to have that understanding and empathy of yes. what you have experienced. Right. So, sorry. And, no, 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 that's exactly on. it. That's exactly it. For me, it was just like, I just want someone who gets it. And some people, and I've got lots of followers um, from the podcast who say that for them, they wanted to find someone as far removed from themselves as possible. Mm. So they didn't have anything that they could relate back to self to make it easier for themselves. But actually I needed to find women I because of the sexual abuse because of a tempestuous relationship with my mother where I pretty much raised my mother raised myself raised my brothers I didn't have a good relationship with women because I didn't have a good relationship Mm. with myself so I actually needed to find a woman who was Nigerian who had all of these things so in building something that was positively relational with her then I could work on myself Um, and if I started to feel safe with her then I could feel safe with myself that's mm. how I saw it. And actually it helped a great deal. And she was incredible. Um, she started teaching me vocabulary that I didn't know before in terms of wounding and trauma. Um, so that was wonderful. Then that ended, that was through the NHS as well. And then years later, because I had such a great experience with her, I knew what I wanted again. So I had um, a, um, a Caribbean woman and Cheryl, she was great fantastic and she was different to any other therapist I'd met because I thought therapists were meant to be like oh yes and very kind of like professional not that Mm. she wasn't professional but just very stoic yeah yeah yeah. whereas I would be telling Cheryl something and I'd be like and then this happened she'd be like what even I'm vexed wow (laughs) 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 and I loved how animated she was and I would look forward to our sessions but actually she did her job well because I look forward to our sessions even when we had to um, discuss difficult things whereas with Sarah if I knew we had to discuss something difficult I'd call in sick and I wouldn't show up yeah Mm. but because um, Cheryl had that kind of behavior and that demeanor about her I knew that even the difficult subjects we'd be okay and so I had those sessions and then I decided that you know what I didn't want to keep having to wait go through the NHS and do all of those things because they make you jump through so many hoops and you just you feel less lesser than before you even get into the sessions and because I've got the studio now I don't have lots and lots of disposable income, but I made a vow to myself that the disposable income that I do have will go into that. So um, it's like 60 pounds an hour, but it's the best hour ever. Mm. Because now my um, therapist, Emma, she's great. And she calls me out on my bullshit a lot. So if I try to get away from talking about something, because I'm someone that's very good at theorizing things and existing um, a lot in like the cerebral part of my body and being able to tell you how things are but I refuse to feel how things are Mm. because I think that it will stop me and then I won't be able to work and I won't be able to and I'm all about being productive Emma works with me on no 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 sit with what you just said and tell me what that feels like I'm like oh but I could tell you a theory (laughs) (laughs) so I don't want to hear your your shitty theories tell me what that feels like and that's really a great thing to have yeah yeah. so for for you so how long's that 
period been through like now to when you started the first uh, therapy session through the NHS? Eight, eight years. Eight years. And what's like personally, what have been the kind of main benefits that you've felt? To <laughs> the main benefits I felt for me, it's just like, I like myself. And that is a big statement. Like I like myself. And I just look at all the years before that I didn't like myself because I felt like I was damaged. Like, what can you like about something that's damaged? And Nayira Wahid has a poem where she says, like, you see your face, you see a flaw. How, when you are the only one with this face? Mm. I'd gotten so kind of embroiled in there being so many faults that um, yeah, I just didn't like myself. And then those sessions made me realize aspects of myself that I'm like, oh, I like this. And I could look at my at pictures of myself without cringing and and just enjoy being me, which means that I ultimately made better decisions. I think when you don't like yourself and you don't realize that you don't like yourself, you choose things to reinforce the fact that you're not worth anything. Now I make better decisions and I think that it shows in my life because now I have things that I can be proud of, mm. you know, like in the physical realm. Yeah, that's great. That's amazing. 